Hi, I'm Richard Llewellyn from Bioresources. We have a small HIA project that starts to look at ways to make macadamias more good bug friendly. And that's by managing the intero in different ways than we have in the past. There's lots of interest in this project and in the use of cover crops to improve soil and farm health. So I've put together a couple of short videos to introduce growers to this work and to some of the ideas that have grown out of this study. In the coming years, there will be more pressure on all of us to reduce our carbon footprints and to manage our farms as environmentally friendly as we can. So we see plant diversity in the intero and cover crops as part of this movement to lower chemical use and to lower environmental impacts. In the first video, I'll talk about our HIA intero management project and some of the resources and interactions between insects that are important for beneficial insects. In the second video, I'll talk about cover crops and how we might be able to use this technology in macadamias. We figured the best place to start was how we could manage the intero better. The major pests don't really use the intero to breed, so there's an opportunity to develop in-field in insectaries. How can we increase the plant diversity? How can we get more pollen and nectar in the system? So we uh, started a little project. It's part of the larger I Macadamia IPM project, uh, just to start looking at insect populations under different intero management systems. The first thing we did was a, a literature review and we realised that there was a lot going on in this area overseas. Farmers were experimenting and there was quite a lot of research on it. But most of the, it seems to be more on focused on planting of intero crops and cover crops, uh, which I'll talk about in the second video. But um, we are more focused in, at this stage on better management of the intero, the existing interos. There's already a good level of diversity on most farms and perhaps managed differently, it will provide more resources for beneficials. Underpinning this project is the idea that natural enemies don't just appear and maintain good levels. Predators need food and parasitoids need host and food. So the principles of managed plant diversity in crops go something like this. If you have more light, uh, you get more intero growth. Uh, we all know this, uh, but if you have more diversity of plant species, then you get more diversity of arthropod species. Um, and the overwhelming majority of these are what we call non-economic. They, they don't affect the crop, but they are part of the food web. And then within this mix, if we have more pollen and more nectar producing plants in the mix, uh, then we get a more abundance and diversity of natural enemies. So this in turn leads to a crop that's more resistant to pest incursions. Small numbers of pests coming in are more likely to be consumed by predators within the system. Pest outbreaks are more likely to be controlled at the very early stage, sometimes undetectable stage. And then you get less serious pest outbreaks and also this system is better for pollinators. That's the theory anyway, because in reality we are growing a monoculture and we do have a long harvest period where we do make the, the crop very unfavorable for beneficial insects. So what we're trying to do is find ways to buffer the system so we're not completely dependent on chemical interventions and also so we support any biologicals that we may introduce into the crop. At this stage I'll just say a bit more about the resources that are desirable to have in the crop for these beneficial insects. I'll start with predators. Predators feed directly on their host. For instance, hoverfly maggots feed on aphids, mites and thrips. But the adults feed on pollen, nectar, or honeydew from aphids, for example. Likewise, lacewing larvae are generalist predators, feeding on aphids, mites, moth eggs, and lace bug, etc. But the adults stage feeds on pollen and nectar. They'll lay more eggs, and they'll live longer, 
if they have good food sources. And once again, ladybirds, lots of different ladybirds feeding on a wide range of hosts. Uh, the adults may feed on, on the host as well, but they also feed on nectar and pollen, and that can help them uh, live longer and lay more eggs. Predatory mites feed on mites and uh, thrips, but they'll benefit from pollen sources. It's been common practice in citrus for many years to grow rose grass in the intero. The pollen's very good for predatory mites. Another major group of predators are spiders. These have a wide host range and they'll be more numerous if there are lots of things for them to eat. And the intero can help provide these non-economic insects. Spiders are probably the most significant predator of fruit spotting bug. So these are very important predators. I got these photos in my backyard. Moving up the food chain, we have insectivorous birds and micro bats. A lot of what we call honey eaters are also big insect eaters. They will feed on fruit spotting bug and uh, green vegetable bug and lots of other insects. Here we have a scarlet honey eater. We're not sure if it's feeding on lace bug or nectar, but if you watch carefully, you'll see it grab an insect. There it goes. Moving on to parasitoids. Uh, parasitoids generally are more host specific than predators. They lay their eggs into or on, onto a host and uh, use it to rear their own young and kill the host in the process. Many adult parasitoids don't need food to lay some eggs, but they will live longer and be more fecund if there are, there's pollen, nectar or honeydew sources nearby. This is an important point. Growers are probably familiar with Mactrix and maybe Anastatus, but our other major pests, uh, fruit spotting bug, uh, green vegetable bug, Sagastus, they all have some parasitoids. And if we can make conditions better for these parasitoids, then this will help us out in the long run. A diverse intero will also be friendly to pollinators. There are more than just honeybees that pollinate macadamias. There are other bees, there are stingless bees, there are various beetles, including pollen beetles, and various flies that all contribute to pollination. Clearly, these ideas and principles are only applicable in an orchard that has light entering the crop, or which is a young crop and wide enough rows to allow an intero to grow. The crop pictured above clearly is problematic, and this, these ideas provide more reason for farms to remove alternate rows and provide a better environment for beneficial insects and to have a more diverse uh, soil biology. For our intero study, we selected 10 sites. Four sites were what we call focus sites where we do in-depth identifications plus six standard sites. At each site, we compared arthropod and plant abundance and diversity under the standard regular mown system versus a much less mown intero. We used yellow sticky traps and sweep nets and suction sampling to collect our, our samples. And we've collected a lot of data and now we're entering the data analysis phase. Project manager Abigail Maycomb has identified 160 different plant species over the 10 sites. But there are probably 10 or so dominant species at each site. And our arthropod ID team has identified over 130 families of arthropods. Uh, lots of parasitoids, uh, beetle and diptera families. Um, some areas may have 20 families on one sticky card. But at this stage, and as expected, there's more abundance and diversity of both plants and arthropods in the less mown treatments, especially parasitoids and diptera or flies. There are more pronounced differences again when comparing mixed plant species into row with an intero with just a few or a couple or even one species like smothergrass or kakuya. There were more differences again when intero crop crops had been planted deliberately in the intero. 
but there was much less difference between the treatments during long dry spells and we've had a few of those in the last couple of years. So at this stage we su suggest growers try and reduce their mowing when that's practical and during the harvest period they try and keep a strip or a mohawk down the centre of the row if their rows are wide enough. Also when they are mowing if they can try and do alternate row mowing they don't row the, mow the whole farm at the same time. Uh, the next step is to disturb the soil a little bit in the intero and let some other grasses and weeds come up during the growing phase of the crop. Rats are often mentioned at a as a potential problem with reduced mowing but at our 10 sites uh, we only had a couple that had a little bit of rat uh, issues but this was sorted out with selective mowing and alternate row mowing. Growers who have young crops or growers who have removed alternate rows uh, should consider uh, planting inter-row crops in those spaces. Uh, we'll talk more about that in the next video. Thanks to all our collaborators that have made this work possible and those that have supported this work including the Soil Care Mob, uh, Bonnie Walker, uh, Dave Forrest and friends and uh, also the inspiration from Rex Harris and of course Morris Collins for his uh, dare, daredevil feats to find the uh, perfect pick. <laughs>